If you're passionate about something, and this is truth as I've been able to experience it over and over, there's always a way to do what you love. What you love is at the wheel, but there's these spokes around it. There's always a way to get in the top 1% of some aspect of, of the thing you love and to monetize it. It's hard to get good at a hard skill. It, people think, oh, if I can just do what I love, I'll be happy all the time. It's actually the opposite. Like if I really wanted to be happy all the time, I would just watch TV all the time. I love television and right. I, would, I would watch TV. But but if I really want to do something that I, I, I love, not just that makes me happy, but I love, let's say I love tennis. Well, to get better at tennis, probably 50% of the time, once you, once you hit your skill level uh, before you need to start learning, um, you're going to lose 50% of the time. And losing, if you're really competitive and you love winning, love winning at tennis, you, it's going to be very unpleasant. And then you're going to play in tournaments and you're going to lose most of the tournaments you play in in the beginning. So you have to be willing to commit to a, a, a bit of pain to get be in the top 1% of an industry that's very competitive. It's very competitive because it's very difficult, but the rewards are great. And it's going to be unpleasant for a long time. Uh, you know, when I was started investing and started learning how to invest, I lost money for a long time which is very painful. Or when I started playing poker, I played poker professionally for a while and you lose and you don't even understand why you lose because everybody is so much better. So you have to mm -hmm. really commit to learning while you're, while you're in pain. And, but then once you do, you learn the nuances of mastery, you learn the, you build a community of people who also are passionate about what you're passionate about and you find freedom because you're able to, monetize what you love doing. And it's so important in life. I think, I really think the motivation for doing this is people underestimate. Yeah, I, I, oh man, I, I say, I totally agree. And I, I feel like, again, like I'm in the same business and as you're, which is just like showing people, Hey, first of all, and the, and the hardest thing we were talking about this before we hit uh, record is, is getting them to the first step is just believing that it's possible. Yeah. And that's also the step that's most people's undoing. Cause like once you're in the game, you'll learn the game just by being in the game long enough. As long as you don't take yourself out of the game, it's getting in the game and staying in the game long enough is where most people struggle. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the 10,000 hour rule because I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that either. Um, and, and, and playing an instrument and playing a sport are probably the two things where that rule most applies because so much of it is about neuron, like teaching, like creating muscle memory, mechanical proficiency, training joints and ligaments and neurons to fire and see, you know what I mean? It's just so physical. Like investing right. is very different than like a golf swing. Right. Uh, but, but if you, if, you know, separating aside the physically demanding aspect of certain things that where you just, there probably is, it's probably harder to skip the line on that part of it. Well, may, maybe yes, maybe no, because like, let's take the piano as an example. And I agree after a certain age, you have muscle memory and it's a little harder to learn, but there's a lot of evidence that adult improvers can build new neural pathways. They didn't used to think mm -hmm. that before, but now they think that and, and who knows, but Again, we're not talking about being the best. We're talking about being, all right. We're not talking about being the best. We're talking about being in the top 1%. So the top 50 or 100,000 people. But then right. let's add one more component. Let's say you specialize very specifically in playing famous rap songs on the piano. Right, so right. See, like on YouTube, if you search for like Dr. Dre piano, there's these classical pianists who play, you know, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg on the piano. And it sounds so great. And imagine, you know, you did that and then you picked a couple of other genres that are unusual. So now you're like the best, not only in the top 1% of, you know, jazz piano players, but you might be in the top one, one thousandth of 1% of jazz piano players who use that skill to play uh, covers of rap songs or techno right. songs right. or, or, you know, movie soundtracks or, you know, violin concertos or whatever. And to be in the top 1%, I do believe you could probably do that as an adult, even with piano, but with something like investing where it's a little bit more mental, again, age doesn't really help that much. It, it hurts more than helps for anything that requires memory or calculation, but 
it, you have a, 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 the benefits of age is our intuition. So you always work with what you've got. And okay, let's say I focus instead of investing on Apple or Tesla or Google, I become a specialist in kind of like micro cap stocks, right? I come become a specialist in small companies that provide the components to electric vehicles, or I become a specialist in weird arbitrage opportunities in DeFi crypto tokens, right. or, or there's even, there's a, did you know, there's an exchange that collectibles like baseball trading cards have IPOs. So for instance, a 1952 Mickey Mantle baseball card is worth $20 million. But what if it IPOs, so you could buy 10 shares of that Mickey Mantle card. And as the collectible market goes up in value, your shares will go up in value. And it turns out that re the historical returns on baseball cards is much greater than the stock market. So you could become an expert on the best in the world mm -hmm. using your investing knowledge and skills with an esoteric investment category like trading cards. So there's lots of ways to combine things also to go from being in the top 1% of a standard field to being the best at the intersection of two fields. Again, like what if I had just stuck to entrepreneurship? And my first company I started in 1995, what if I had just stuck with that? Maybe I would have been a, you know, one of these guys who invested in Uber or something. Or what if I had just stuck with running a hedge fund? Instead, I did it for a few years and then stopped. Maybe I would have a huge hedge fund now. Like, I always yeah. wonder these things and, and I've done well doing things that I'm passionate about. And that's part of the subject of my book, Skip the Line that just came out. But I always, sometimes I wonder like, oh, maybe I'd have a, a billion, not that you need a billion dollars, but maybe it would just be a different right. picture for me right now. And again, not that it's bad. I love, I love my life right now, but uh, you know, it's just, an, I wonder these things. Yeah, I, I think about it, you know, I have a specific thing that begs that question all the time, which is the piano. Because, I know, I was thinking about that with you. Like yeah. if you had you had started the piano, like when you were 16, dropped out of high school, became a professional jazz pianist. I have, by the way, your book that you recommended to me about learning jazz piano, I bought it. And now my oh. son's using it to learn the guitar. And uh, what if you had stuck with that? Like something you passionately loved you would be like the, one of the, the best guys in the world by now. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I learned, so I had about almost 10 year stretch of my life where I lived the way you're describing. Uh, I don't think from the age of 17 to roughly 26, 27, I don't know there's more I could have done to get good at the piano, performing, composing, like that whole set of making music with the piano as my, you know, primary instrument. There's really nothing more I could have done. I practiced so much that ultimately the main reason I had to stop is because I gave myself arthritis in my wrist. Um, I, I went from never playing to working regularly in two or three years to performing pretty much at the top of that, that world in a major US city by you know my early 20s. Like I did it. I was in... in it was not a life I would have wanted to keep going on for another 10 or 20 years. It really wasn't. I, uh, and, and I know, also, and, and, and even with all that progress, I don't know that I still would have been the best in the world or one of the best because I started too late and I started at 16. Now that's, that's an, a, a physical instrument. So there's a spurt, certain biomechanical component to it, kind of like an athletic pursuit, yeah. but I don't know, man, I, I think you've, probably by most people's definitions of joy and fulfillment, you've probably done very well. Yeah. I, I mean, I think so, but some, you know, there's something to be said for wondering what you could have done if you had taken it all the way, but, but you're right. We only have one life to live and interests and passions change. And so part of the reason I wrote this book, skip the line is that if you change, let's say you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or even 70 mm -hmm. and you change interest and change your passion. Let's say you go from being an accountant and suddenly you're obsessed with being a sushi chef. Right. Is it possible to not only be in the top 1% in the world of being a sushi chef, not in the top 10 or the top one, but the top 1%, which could be a, a big group of chefs. Could you be in the top 1% of being a, a sushi chef? And furthermore, in order to really enjoy it, it's nice to be able to make money at it so that right. you can devote all your all your whole day at it instead of it just being a hobby. And so 
most people were telling me every time I've ever changed interest, sometimes I was forced to change because I went broke or I went out of business or whatever. And sometimes I changed just because I developed new passions and I get obsessed with my passions. And every single time, and I'm sure, I'm sure Jeff, this happened to you from the age of 17 on, every single time I change interests or industries, people told me, you can't, James, you can't skip the line. You can't do that. You can't do it. Don't even try to skip the line. Like 100% of the time, someone told me that. And it always threw me off a little bit until I realized, oh, I, I can do this. They're the ones who can't, or they're the ones who, for whatever reason, either good or bad, they don't want me to change, or they're they're mm -hmm. thinking out for me. They think it's not possible, and they don't want me to be hurt. And but there, and then I realized there's the same set of techniques I used over and over and over again to not only get in the quickly in the top one percent of the world of whatever it was I was interested in, but make money at it. And I've seen books about learning things and I've seen books about monetization, but I've never seen books that consider them hand in hand, which you have to do if you're going to truly master something. Yeah, I, I agree. I also, I totally agree that I think people dramatically, it's weird. They underestimate what it'll take to accomplish something, but then they also underestimate what they could do if they did what it takes to accomplish something. You know? Yeah. Cause, right. Right. Because a, it's it, you know, there's like this thing called the 10,000 hour rule, which um, you know, was developed by this professor and popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book right. Outliers. And it basically says if you want to um, master something, you have to put 10,000 hours of what's called deliberate learning into it. And but what they're talking about really is being the the number one in the world or being the top ten in the world. But you know, let's say you want to be um, I don't know, the best at uh, jazz piano in the in the world, or, mm -hmm. or you want to be in the top 1%. Well, there's probably something like 10 million or 5 million jazz piano players in the world. And right. so to be in the top 1%, that means you have to be in the top 50,000 of them, not in the top 10. And if you're in the top 1%, that's probably good enough in most cases, particularly if you have, if you can add something unique to your, to your style, you could probably make a, a decent living at it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even tennis, like if you're, if, if you're, if you're in the top 1%, you, you obviously are not going to get sponsorships. You're, you're not going to be one of the main, even if you're ranked number 200 in the world in tennis, you're not going to make a great living from playing tennis, but from tennis itself, you could be a coach. You could, start a tennis racket store. You could have a podcast about tennis. You can write books about tennis. You could probably do an online course teaching tennis and YouTube videos about tennis. You could make probably a great living being in the top 1%. Not even if you're, even if that puts you number 100,000th in the world. Um, so you're not making money from tennis tournaments, which, which is the top 10 only, but, right. uh, but you can make a living from tennis if you're in the top 1% in the world. It's totally. Very, yeah. Very, and, it really works. Yeah, which I mean, everybody, you know, depending on what they want, this is how I approach life uh, is like, for if there's something you care about, and it's fun, you know, it's like, what's the minimum amount of achievement and accomplishment you have to have in something to get what you want out of it. If your goal is to make, you know, have a net worth of $500 million, and, and your means is tennis, great, you're you better be named Roger Federer. Yeah, but if your goal is to like just love the crap out of tennis and get to do it a lot, you're right. You're totally right. Top fifty thousands, amply good. So, so like in, in this book, I have a bunch of chapters about how to learn something super quickly, uh, and in particular, I have something called the ten thousand experiment rule, as opposed to the ten thousand hour rule. But in terms of the monetization, like what you were just saying, I, I have a bunch of chapters about that. But one is called the spoke and wheel approach. So let's say tennis is your wheel. Now you have, okay, being a professional tennis player is only one spoke. Like, look at me, I'm, you know, an old man already, and I'm not gonna be a professional tennis player. Like you said, you have to be Roger Federer, who's the most physically fit person on the planet, maybe. <laughs> and that's definitely not gonna be me, but maybe I could learn enough that I could do a podcast interviewing all the Roger Federers of the world, and I could sell advertising to, you know, all the, tennis 
clothing or tennis equipment manufacturers. And, you know, and then I could do an, an online or I could write a book, think like a, think like a tennis player. Or there was a famous book, The Inner Game of Tennis, which sold 4 million copies written in the mm-hmm. 70s, but write an updated version of that. Or, um, you know, I'm just making this up as I go along, but I could maybe, uh, you know, create a bunch of online courses about tennis, hiring different tennis players to do it. Or I could be a, a, a commentator for ESPN about tennis or make, maybe set up a fantasy tennis league. I don't think there's any fantasy tennis leagues out there. I'm just, I'm just ripping, but right, right. you know, or I could, uh, now I'm going to even go further. There are many websites out there for uh, gambling and even micro betting. There's um, a website that recently started, I'm forgetting the name now uh, for micro betting. Cause it's legal now in most States, meaning will Roger Federer um, hit an ACE in this game right. uh, or, or you could bet on stuff like that. And I can use data to analyze all the times he hit an ACE before to find high probability situations to make these micro bets. And if that works, I could set up a hedge fund where people could give me money and I keep 20% of their profits as I invest by betting in this alternative, you know, esoteric betting, you know, investing strategy. So I'm just ripping like, but that's all the spokes where I could take my passion and love for tennis. By the way, I don't have a passion and love for tennis, but if I did, Right. That's how I would think about it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love what you're saying. And, and what I really love about what you're saying, and this is, this is selfish because it's where it, it overlaps with my like, purpose in this world, is the light that you're casting for people upon the, the infinite variety and scope of possibilities in this world to do something other than just what you think you have to do because someone else told you that and you, you think it's your only option. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Like I remember one time, I remember one time I was working at HBO. This is in the mid nineties. And you know, I had an idea for a TV show and a web show and the web had just started. I was making HBO's website. My title at HBO was junior analyst programmer. So I was so I, my, the, the CEO of HBO was my boss's 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 boss. And so that's how low on the totem pole I was. And not only that, HBO cared about entertainment. They didn't care about the the programmers who were making the website. Right. Like we we were not we were the only department in a different building than the rest of HBO. Like they just did not want to see us at all because we were gross. And so <laughs> one day I'm um I had this idea though and I wanted, I didn't want to tell my boss because he didn't have the power to say yes. And he would have said, you know, wait your turn. Don't skip the line. Right. So I'm walking over to the main building where the CEO's office is. And I run into this friend of mine who was like, worked in the marketing department. And she said, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to Jeff Bukas's office, the, the CEO. He then became the CEO of Time Warner, a really great CEO. And he sold Time Warner to recently to, I think, gosh, AT&T maybe, I forget. But, um, and now he's retired. But, uh, so I said, I'm going to the CEO's office, Jeff's office. And she said, you can't do that. You can't, you got, you, she literally said, you can't skip the line. You got to go, go to your boss first. And he's going to get upset at you if you go to the CEO or his boss will get upset at you. You're not supposed to do this. And I said, oh, I, but I, you know, he won't even understand this idea. Like Jeff's the only person I could talk to about this idea. And she's like, well, okay, good luck. So then I walk on and I, quickly past Jeff's secretary before she could stop me. Jeff Bukas is secretary. I go into Jeff's office, this massive office, the CEO of HBO. He looks up and he's like, he's like curious. He's like, who, who are you? And I said, listen, I'm building the website. And just like, and then I present my idea. So I said, just like HBO became really known for its original shows, not just for putting up movies. Mm-hmm. How about the website make real original HBO style web shows. Like we make original web shows that are made for the web medium. And he said, I don't care. You, this is your generation. You do it. <laughs> and so I went back to my boss and I said, Jeff Bucas told me to do this. And so I made like a web show. I called it 3 a.m. What's going on in New York City at three in the morning. And I did it for about three years. I shot it as a TV pilot, one for HBO documentaries as well. And it changed my life. And then other companies wanted to hire me to make to do original websites for them. And I built that into a business, which was the first business I ever started and sold. And then I met, went immediately broke afterwards. But uh, that was an example. Or another time, uh, I wanted to start a hedge fund. 
but I had no real experience investing, and at least job experience. And so I went to a, a neighbor of mine who was a professional investor for, I think for JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley. And he, and he like, he, I said, is there any way I can maybe get a job trading for your company? And, or, or, I, or maybe I could start a hedge fund. Would you invest in my hedge fund? And he looked at me like, he almost like he felt sorry for me. And he's like, you know, maybe you should get an MBA first and uh, maybe work at Goldman Sachs or another bank, or then work for a small hedge fund, then a big hedge fund, get to know the clients. And I'm like, I'm not, why would I spend 15 years of my life doing that? And so again, there's ways to skip the line, but in this case, I experimented with writing some software and there are easy platforms to do that, even if you don't know programming. And I wrote software analyzing the stock market and finding high probability situations for investing. And I showed my software to other hedge fund managers who invested money with me. And I started writing for the Wall Street Journal about it. And that led to more investors and boom, everyone told me I couldn't do it. And I did it uh, and, you know, and, and on and on. But then one thing stopped me and I wanted to be much later around 2015. I wanted to be a stand up comedian. I just loved it. I loved going on stage and telling jokes and making people laugh, but it was a really difficult skill to learn. And so mm -hmm. that's the other part of this book is learning really difficult skills. But I just remember one time this guy, this one comedian said, James, 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 listen. And he said it again. You can't skip the line. You know, you got to, we all paid our dues. You got to start off doing open mics. Then you got to, you know, hang out at bigger clubs and maybe get the booker to like you. And, you know, and then you have to learn more about comedy, like study all the comedians. And, and he was telling me this right before I was doing my first 60 minute show. And then I was literally then called up to go on stage right when he was telling me I can't do this. And I started thinking, do I really need the 10,000 hour rule for this? Like, it's gonna take me forever. But then I realized, no, the same techniques, like, you know, divide this skill into micro skills, do experiments. Like I started doing stand-up comedy on subways in order to quickly try things out. And uh, I did all the other, you know, things I mentioned in the book. And, you know, I, I've toured all around the world now doing stand-up comedy. I've, I had, I had four gigs booked this month uh, in Kansas City, Cleveland, Cincinnati, New York City, but I canceled them for due to COVID stuff. But, you know, maybe next month I'll do them. Who knows? Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I, I, I mean, God, I just love this subject. And and by the way, thank you. Um, your team sent me a copy of your book and also apologies. I haven't been able to like actually even physically open it. I got it last week. Um, uh, no, no problem at all. I just love talking about this stuff. And yeah. by the way, thank you for telling me that because most people do not tell me that. <laughs> no, it, I mean, actually, if it, it wasn't there just now when I got home because the cleaners had been there and they put, put it in a drawer. But until this morning, it was actually on my nightstand next to my bed. So. And I, I always tell people when I haven't read it, uh, their, their books, and it's no big deal. It's just the topic's important to everybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, you know, to get all the details, they could, people can read the book, but also I'm happy to talk about anything, anything in it. And whether it's how to learn fast in a, in a unique way or how to monetize and, and so on. Well, I feel like we're kind of in the same business, uh, although you're in many business, we're both in many business, but in this part of our life, we're both in a similar business, whether you call it skipping the line or bucking the trend or defying conventional wisdom or disregarding, you know, well-intended advice from your parents and teachers, like whatever you want to call it, it's, it's the, you have control and, and empower, and you can be empowered to make decisions in your life about where you want to go and what you want to do and what you want to be compatible with making money and, you know, otherwise tending to normal responsibilities, right? Like you want to be able to do whatever you want and still have a functional life. That's the dream for most people, right? It's like, oh, I, I clock in and I stamp, you know, car parts in a factory for a living. What if I could just pay my bills, but also get to yo-yo? Yeah, right? uh, you know, it's so funny you said yo-yo because I was gonna use that as an example just now. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, like I have one friend, really great guy. He is like, he, is, he I always say to him on the weekends, he's my next door neighbor. I always say, hey, um, you wanna play cars or something at your house? because I know if he says yes, he's going to cook. And he is like the best maker chef of like any kind of pork products, like sausages, pork, any kind of meat. He's just amazing. And I love it. And he, I don't know whether or not he likes his job, but I know he would love to, 
somehow be a chef professionally instead of just doing it on the weekend. And, but I think a lot of, it, you know, you only, have, again, it's, you only have one life and it's important. You don't start that life when you're 60 or 70 or whenever you think mm -hmm. you have enough money saved to re retire or whatever. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Oh my gosh, you you just totally nailed it uh, from from based on my experience. And, and in fact, it's funny, I tell my trainer all the time, I go, look, I'm never going to be the fittest influencer on the internet. Like there's, there's fitness, I mean, there's fitness guys that look like, you know, Greek gods or a dime a dozen on Instagram, right? Yeah. But can I'm, I be- I'm one of them, but I don't like to brag about that. Yeah, but, right, know. of course, of course. Well, um, but I, I say, I wonder if I can be the fittest digital marketer on the internet. You know, yeah. or, or like, and, and then where it gets, where I know I've got it is, can I be the internet market or the, the, the entre, you know, I'm not a digital marketer anymore. Now I'm an entrepreneurial educator, whatever, you know, label I want to put on. Can I be the fittest and most musically proficient entrepreneurial educator on the internet? Right. And I let's think say, I've actually got that locked up, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Let's say you've got that locked up and then there's ways to start, okay, that's the wheel. And then there's ways to start building spokes around it. And then there's ways to start scaling it. You can, you can, and I have a chapter on this too, um, where I call it idea exponentials, where you have a good idea, it makes you money. But now can you generalize it? Like now can you say for anybody who's the best at the intersection of three things, teach a course on how to monetize it. Mm -hmm. And so there might be people who are great at comedy and rap and the stock market. Well, how do you combine all those things? What are the spokes for that? And then uh, how do you monetize it? You could teach people. And look, companies do this all the time. Amazon started as a bookstore. Yeah. Then they started selling clothing, electronics, food, other things. Then they generalized that infrastructure and they sold the infrastructure. So now anybody can sell, can set up a store on Amazon, Amazon sellers program. And then they generalized that and said, well, look, we have this huge infrastructure of databases and keeping track of transactions. Let's sell Amazon Web Services. And that's their most, which is a generalized version of that. That's their most profitable center right, right now. Right. So, you know, mimicking the actions of these huge companies might not make you as worth as much of them. With You know, Amazon's worth over a trillion dollars. But, it, hey, I'll take a small, tiny percentage of that if I can mimic that, that model a little bit in my personal life which is not impossible. Yeah, it's kind of like, remember when MTV used to um, actually show music videos? Yeah, long time ago. And you're right, they used that to build distribution, build production, build creative people, build, you know, cultivate talent development, and now they, oh, whatever else they do, you know? Oh yeah, well, the, well, for instance, they started a production company, so now they make shows for other channels too. Yeah. So MTV Productions is, uh, is a very profitable division of MTV, and, you know, it's the same with me. Like I might not be the top comedian, stand-up comedian in the world, but for someone with my life background and life experience, I'm, I'm the best. So I get a constant, like, you know, speaking engagement level offers, which is much bigger than the typical co comedian is paid yeah. to be funny at a business conference. There's nobody like me. Right. So, and, and by the way, I don't do this as a career. It really is more of a, you know, I, I'm, very into it, but it is borderline hobby, but I make money at it. <laughs> but uh, other things like, you know, again, like you, you figure out what your passion is, then you figure out the various spokes or niches, niches that you want to specialize in that you could be the best in. And then, you know, you start to intersect with other things in your life. And, and it, it's very, I go through all this in the book, but it's very easy to start generating income depending on how you approach it the hard part really is i mean that's hard too monetizing is always hard which is why I, I talk about persuasion in the book persuasion skills are necessary but the skills learning the skill learning to be in the top one percent in a field you love and maybe a field you're just switching to is is very critical and very hard and but that's why i wanted to when i looked back at it and tried to analyze it it was really helpful to me to put it into words. What am I doing? What is this technique? Oh, okay, I'm going to call this instead of 10,000 hours, it's 10,000 experiments. But 
really more like a hundred experiments, but my editor wanted to call it 10,000 experiments. Right. And then another thing is I divide every skill into micro skills. So you'll appreciate this one. Being an entrepreneur, there's no such skill as entrepreneurship. Right. Entrepreneurship is like a basket of micro skills. There's negotiating, there's having ideas, there's execution, there's sales, there's marketing, there's leadership, there's management, and, and on and on. So you learn which micro skills you, are, you can learn quickly and you set up training programs for them. So I have this notion of uh, plus minus equal, get a mentor, find equals who you can exchange ideas with and find a minus. In other words, teach what you're learning because that helps you really to understand it at a deep fundamental mm -hmm. level. And so I have various techniques like that. And I've been doing a little experiment lately, which is since about mid-December, I've been doing this. I decided to take chess, which had a surge in interest uh, because of the TV show, The Queen's Gambit. Mm -hmm. And I decided to be become better than I ever was before. At I last studied chess almost 30 years ago, and I was a young chess master, but I lost all my skills. Just like if you don't play the piano for 30 years, you'd have to almost start from scratch again, which is mm -hmm. what was happening to me. So I take all the ideas and skip the line. And I, I you know, for the past three, three and a half, four months, I've now, I've, I've now probably equaled or surpassed where I was at my peak in chess in the nineties. And, you know, now I'm going for much greater. And this was at a, in a much faster time speed than I, than I thought I was going to be able to do it. And it's been so much fun doing it too. Like, I love it. You know, I, it's so funny you say that. I just realized I think I'm actually doing the same thing. I, um, you know, I still play piano uh, most, I say most mornings. I mean, I travel a lot. So when I'm home, I play piano an average about 45 minutes every morning, Monday through Friday. So let's say on average, I play piano 10 days a, a month, 10 to 15 days a month for about 45 minutes. Right. That's not that much, really. I mean, no. And in fact, that's how I was with with chess. I would play yeah. like random what's called blitz chess. Like you take a few each side takes a few minutes. If you run out of time, you lose. And it was not good enough. It, 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 it's not the right way to get better. It's a way to have fun and to enjoy it and to still get pleasure from it. But st I steadily got worse and worse and worse because it just unless you have a, a disciplined, systematic way of of enhancing a skill, you're only going to get worse, even if even if you practice, even if you do 10,000 hours of, of practice. And so maybe you're experiencing, I don't know if you're experiencing the same thing, but while the rest well, of the world is learning new training skills, you're playing and which is different. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so what I realized though, is I think I've actually been doing the same thing because there's a piece um, called La Campanella Etude by Franz Liszt that's one of very the, difficult <laughs> one of the hardest pieces in the piano literature um i mean you're flying like literally the way you people just like drive by and wave their hand uh -huh. you're doing this on the keyboard for like seven minutes straight almost only your thumb and your pinky are hitting notes precisely that are anywhere from one to two octaves apart at warp speed right yeah and, and so like your pinky has to have like eyes and almost like a gyroscope of its own to just hit that note every single time. Right. And I guess people on listening, this can't see me waving, but I mean, it's insanely go, go look up La Campanella on YouTube and Lang Lang will blow your mind. So I decided like, I'm, I'm only, cause usually I do what you're saying. I sit down, I play like, oh, I play a few scales, get loose. I maybe like play some jazz chords. I like, you know, harmonize a tune I heard on the radio or I visit revisit some old classical favorite or and it's, it is, it's play, it's fun. And it's super rewarding in that way. But I was like, I wonder, even though I'm not a professional anymore, I have nowhere near as much. I don't practice as much in a month now as I used to practice in some days. I wonder if I could learn La Campanella too. And that's all I've been doing for the last, it's probably been two months. So even that's only 20, 25 hours of practice now. Um, and I was like, I'm going to give myself a year and see if I can master the Campanella Etude. And I'll tell you, James, the, just the decision that I'm not even going to play the piano. I'm going to play La Campanella Etude. Hmm. And, and, and the amount that I think about it now when I'm not playing, and it's like get, getting clarity. And I kind of feel like you, you nailed it when you, when you talk about micro tasks. I've taken playing the piano and reduced it down to playing one piece on the piano. 
Right. And think of all the micro skills needed for that. Like there's, like you say, the coordination of every finger. There's also, it helps to understand the structure of the piece. So when you're in the middle of the piece, you know, just intuitively when, you know, it changes chords or it changes, you know, it's, it's rhythm and the, right. you know, and, you know, learning how to, um, you know, read and understand, you know, it's very complicated. Well, and it's in G sharp minor, which is a complicated key, but I can tell you this now. Yeah, it's in G sharp minor. Sorry. Uh, I know G sharp minor so much better than I did two months ago. I yeah. know I, my, I, like, here's, I'll tell you this after only two months, like I'm not ready to perform it or anything, but I am playing it far and away better than I ever did when I was a professional playing eight or 10 hours a day. And, and I bet you, I bet you, if you had a, if you thought about in terms of plus minus equals also. So if you found someone to kind of even once a week or once a month, kind of sit yeah. with you, who's an expert sit with you and give you like tips because they know things about training they know things about that piece that you might not know and uh equals would be other maybe adult improvers in piano where there's plenty of groups on facebook or, or linkedin and minus what if you were to give some lessons about the fundamentals that will just ground those fundamentals so i've been doing that but what i do in the mornings i actually go live on instagram and i have a little mount where i just put my phone up there and i actually just practice for the world to listen to but oh, that's great. What oh, I do I'm gonna listen, you got to send me the link to listen. Oh yeah, sure. It's, it's on my Instagram. It'll tell you, I go live at, it's usually around, I guess for you, it'd be about seven in the morning, five in the morning, my time. And, um, but what I've been doing is I've been using La Campanella as a teaching model for other truths about other things. So, you know, as my right. role as an entrepreneurial educate educator, I've been making La Campanella into an entrepreneurial metaphor and I teach about it all the time and it has accelerated the learning so much to your point. Right, no, totally. And you know what you should consider too is why don't you stream yourself learning on this, this piece on Twitch. Mm -hmm. And so then you'll learn the skill of being a Twitch streamer. And there's, you know, there's a hundred million kids. Which my son actually is adamant he wants to do. In fact, we are just got him a computer so that he can start doing it. And yeah, I do, I, and I have no idea what the heck he's doing. So you're right. That would be amazing. Yeah, like I've started streaming on Twitch, not heavily yet. I'm, I'm building up because it's a new skill to me. Mm -hmm. And but in the process of relearning chess to be better than I was or even better than 30 years ago, I've been streaming my progress. So that creates a category because a lot of people are interested in adult improvement in general. I've been every now and then I don't want to bore people with it, but I put it on my podcast and uh and also just, again, the pleasure of, of learning deeper nuances. Like you said, you learned G sharp, the G sharp major than ever, more than ever before. These nuances are very pleasurable to learn. And oh, I never oh learned these things. So I, as soon as I decided I wanted to do this, I got myself a coach. Uh, I have equals that I play and, uh, I, and I, I started giving lessons, but then an interesting thing happened. People heard I was doing this. So I have CEOs now calling me up asking me for chess lessons hmm. and and I do it for free but it helps me and it get builds my network of people and you know it's uh you know it's people these high powered CEOs respect me in this different way now and it's just been a, a fascinating fascinating experience plus not only just relearning something that I love but the entire way I view it is just different than when I was a kid so so let's talk about one last one piece of this conversation because i feel like i mean it's such an awesome conversation for life fulfillment but you know i have to acknowledge my show is called millionaire secrets i think yes people, most people here have some sort of a financial imperative going as part of their listenership or listener status whatever um so let's talk about actually monetizing and first of all um you know, I, I was thinking about La Campanella Etude or, or when you were talking about being a, a business and, and actually, may I pry, may I ask perhaps an inappropriate question and say, like, as an example, you go speak at a business conference, but you're also the one guy that can do that and tell a few jokes. Yeah. D do you mind if I ask, like, how much could some, can something like that pay you? Yeah, uh, I would say between 30 and 40,000, uh, uh, you know, it depends on the speaking engagement and what I want to do. But like some things I'll do for free, but for like, for like a day or less of work, right? Yeah, I've been paid up to 40,000, but I know people who make much more than that per speaking gig. Uh, I think I think Gary Vaynerchuk makes like 100,000 on a speaking gig, but I don't even 
for me, it's a way to practice comedy. So I love doing it. And, you know, and I'm knowledgeable about a lot of business topics so that I'm the only one who can do that specific role. Like I, I, I do stuff with lots of, you know, well-known, you know, well-named, you know, popular companies. And, uh, but that's just the thing is that, you know, figuring out the spokes is very important. So for instance, you putting on Instagram, your process of playing this, you know, that's one spoke, maybe that becomes the, it's an experiment. So experiments have little downside, but huge upside. So maybe the downside is, you know, you don't gain any Instagram followers, but you have people who just love listening to you play every day. And that's the worst case scenario. The upside is maybe you get a million Instagram followers from it and you start monetizing your Instagram channel. Right. You know, or, or another spoke might be, um, you know, really making YouTube videos, pay, t- taking one piece after another and learning that piece and breaking it down. So if I'm learning how to play a song, I'll, you, I'll, I'll, I'll YouTube search for it and I'll see, oh, here's a, a guy who's like me, who's just learning it and he's showing it step by step as opposed to like a famous concert pianist who's playing it. I'm more interested in watching Jeff Lerner step-by-step show how he's learning this piece that I want to play and you develop a huge YouTube channel or you write about the process of adult improvement or you coach CEOs about what you learned from, you know, uh, which is what you do anyway. This is like your business, Entre Nation. And, uh, you know, for me, when I was a hedge fund manager, I made money investing. I made money as a hedge fund manager. I made money writing, you know, books about finance. I made money speaking, I was a spokesperson for Fidelity. Uh, so I've made money flying around the country speaking at, at their conferences. I started a my own news finance site with the interesting quality that there was not allowed to be any news in it because I, I hate financial news, but I do believe it's interesting to know which top investors own which stocks and build communities of investors. So I built like a social media site for, for finance and I sold that for millions of dollars. Uh, and then as you get into the investment world, you build your network. And so now I invest in companies where my network shows me the right investments that they're focused on. And that becomes great opportunities as opposed to just reading about stocks in the Wall Street Journal. I'm, I'm inside there with my friends who are serious professionals. And you build up spoke after spoke or with um, podcasting. Okay, I started off doing a podcast, but then... Uh, then I started advertisements. Then I started with affiliates. Then I s- sold a course on podcasting and self-publishing and, and so on. And that made good money and, uh, and on and on you build, you build the spokes from, you can make any business, a million dollar business. And, uh, just by looking by, by getting a skill and, and then looking at the spokes, all the spokes, like I know this one guy, Matt Berry was a Hollywood screenwriter, hated it. And he loved sports, but he wasn't going to be a professional athlete. So he started writing blog posts for $200 a post about fantasy sports. And, uh, you know, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars of screenplay. He quit that to make $200 a blog post. But then that turned into his own website about fantasy sports. And then his own, then he managed a, a fantasy sports league. Then he started making, you know, hire people to make software that managed fantasy sports leagues. Now he's the only anchor maybe in the world who focuses on fantasy sports. He's an anchor at ESPN. So all hmm. these folks turn into something. So, so let's, let's maybe, I don't remember if we were talking about this on the show or before the show, but let's maybe wrap this episode where we started yeah. because to hear you explain it. And as you were talking, I was, I was making notes. I was kind of breaking apart the 10,000 hour rule into like, well, what is it? It's, it's actually micro rules. The reason there's this blanket 10,000 hour rule is because it's like, well, it's, that's roughly how much time gives you enough time to, to, to develop all the, the sub skills that go together to form this overall skill. Right. But it, like you said, if you if you said, well, I'm not going to do a one 10,000 hour rule, I'm going to do 10 1000 hour rules because there's 10 different things I need to master. You probably don't need a thousand hours for each of those 10 things. No. And not only that, again, I'm not trying to be in the top 10 in the world. I'm trying to be in the top 1%. Right. So right. As an example, you know, on chess.com, there's 63 million people signed up and I can see every day. What am I in the top? 10%, 5%, 1%. So you can measure progress. Right. And uh, 
you know, so so again, so that that reduces the ten thousand hours to maybe a few hundred hours, really. If you're if you if you break out, like you say, the micro skills, and you do, you figure out the experiments you need to do, you figure out the intersections with other things you've learned that you're gonna that ma- it's gonna make you the unique in the space, mm-hmm. and and so on. So so I, I wrote down technical competence, which I actually broke down between mental and any necessarily like physical muscle mastery or yeah. muscle memory. I wrote down emotional mastery slash grit, which you can kind of be working on all the time, but I do think it requires some intentional personal development time. Yeah, um, definitely. I wrote because down- again, it's, it's, it is emotionally hard to get good at anything, even mildly competitive. Well, and for every hard skill is competitive. For adults, because once we get out of school, we're, supposedly the learning phase of our life is over and now we're in the, let me show off to everyone how smart I am for the rest of my life. So they'll pay me the, the most. Yeah. So it's, it's an ego boost to actually go, you know what? I, I suck at this thing and I'm going to spend time in that space and not get embarrassed. Yeah. Um, but there's that, there's the creativity slash idea muscle, um, the yeah. ability to fi- either innovate or at least find your own unique flavor of whatever the thing is. That's that- really critical because people, let's say you want to write a book. Well, a lot of a lot of books have already been written. You have to have something unique to say. And in order to have something unique to say, it's not going to be like inspiration hits you like lightning. You have to exercise that idea muscle every day. You have to come up with ideas every day, and every now and then you'll have a good idea. But you have but you have to feel abundant about it. Like right, even if you don't execute an idea, don't worry. The next set of ideas might be good. You'll always have ideas if you're abundant in them. Totally, totally. Um, and yeah, and that way you don't chase. a a mediocre idea because you're afraid you're afraid it's gonna be the only one yeah um and then you obviously there's a component of building a network like i mean there's so much uh exponential power and 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 even skill seems to grow it's almost like epigenetics where like as your network changes your your own individual competence changes too commensurate with the 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 power of the network it's actually kind of weird um and, and then, you, but I don't know if it's the chicken or the egg or the cart or the horse or what, but with all of that, there has to be this kind of like foundation of, I wrote down foundation of efficacy where it's like, it has to actually work inside of your functional life. It can't throw everything out of balance or it's unsustainable. Absolutely. That's why it's so important to, uh, particularly if you're above the age of 20, it's so important to combine obsessions and passions with also building the skills for monetization, whether it's mm-hmm. persuasion skills or exercising the idea muscle or learning specific tactics like you show in, in your school about, you know, different types of entrepreneurship or, you know, again, I have, a, you know, this spoken wheel approach to, to kind of brainstorm. And then I have another chapter called conspiracy numbers, which is basically how to evaluate the risks of every business idea you might have. And just things like that are very important or else you could waste a lot, you know, and by the way, execution is not easy. People think, oh, ideas are a dime a dozen, execution's everything. Execution's just, execution ideas are a subset of ideas and you're either good or bad at them. There's this whole yeah. spectrum of being good at execution. That's a really good point. It actually requires creativity, just probably just as much creativity to execute well as it does to ideate well. Cause you're, yeah. you're always, you know, you're, you're dealing with, frankly, a more complicated problem than whatever problem you're out there trying to solve, which is the internal problem of your own life and how right. to execute within that frame without breaking other things. That's its own entrepreneurial problem to solve. So my, you know, I, I love the idea of chunking down the, the larger concept of, of mastery and also uh, defining mastery as, as entry into the 1%, not the top 10, because those are two completely different things. I right. love all of that. My, my question is what, you know, whether they just listen to this interview or they, uh, what I hope they do do is click over and listen to the next, the interview that I'm going to do on your channel, which we're actually going to record here shortly. Um, because I suspect they're going to end up being counterparts and very complimentary conversations. Um, or, or they just read your book, which I also a- absolutely say you should do because it has, um, really, really beautified my nightstand wonderfully. And, and they <laughs> should have that in their life too. Um, and then do what I'm going to do, which is actually read it. But whatever they do, we and I both know that 99% of the people aren't going to actually 
execute and do what we're suggesting. Yeah, because um, what if I had ever said, what if I ever believed the people who told me you can't do it? And probably, you know what? Probably there's lots of things I did believe people on and I didn't do them and I can't even remember what they were. But right. people will always tell you, you can't. So how do we, do you think it's worth taking five minutes and maybe speaking to that? Like, yeah. Yeah, and I, honest, I, it's, it's a good thing to resolve ahead of time. Because honestly, if you're going to be one of those people, I mean, I hate to cost you book sales here, but like, don't even bother. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And the thing is, when someone says you can't do something, you can't skip the line. Again, it's important to realize there, there's a lot of reasons for it. Yes, there's the obvious. They might be jealous if you succeed and they don't. And so they don't, they like you, they like the Jeff that they know right now. They like the James they know right now, who's, mm -hmm. you know, has has dreams, but doesn't really act on them because right. they've never really acted on them. Or maybe they can't do something. And so they don't want you to do it if they can't do it. Or maybe, you know, maybe they really sincerely believe you can't switch industries. You can't go from being a computer programmer to having a TV show. And they don't want you to get hurt in the process because it is gonna hurt. And, uh, it's going to hurt even if you succeed. It's going to hurt worse when you when you don't succeed and they think you're not going to succeed. So they're trying to protect you. So it's important to realize if you're passionate about something, and this is truth as I've been able to experience it over and over, there's always a way to get into the top 1% of some angle of what you're interested in. Like my friend who was fascinated by sports, he didn't become a professional athlete. He became the leading expert on the planet on fantasy sports and has made millions of dollars in the process. And I know many people like that. Uh, so there's always a way to do what you love. What you love is at the wheel, but there's these spokes around it. There's always a way to get in the top 1% of some aspect of, of the thing you love and to monetize it. There's 100%. I can do it. You give me any topic. I could do it with gardening. I could do it with chess. I could do it with running a hedge fund, obviously, but the hard thing there was breaking into the network and, and on and on I've been doing, it. I, I had never run a business before I did it. My first business, uh, you know, and it was difficult. It's, it's a hard thing. And, but the most important thing is you're going to get discouraged. You're going to feel like you can't do it at different times. You're going to feel like, why am I even trying? Like I'm, I'm too old or it's too late or it's, it's never been done before, but I can tell you, not only from my own experience, but from the 800 guests I've had on my podcast, ranging from uh, Richard Branson, who, while he was a 27 year old record store owner, started a major airline by borrowing, calling up Boeing and borrowing a 70, a 747 plane. Like, if he could do that, <laughs> then trust me, you could do what you need to do. Like, can you imagine being a 27 year old? you know, record store owner and calling Boeing Airlines out of nowhere and asking to borrow a 747 jet for an airline that doesn't yet exist. <laughs> like, and he did it and they lent it to him because he had persuasion skills too. Yeah. And, and, you know, and he believed in himself. If he didn't believe in himself, I mean, their first answer was obviously, no, you can't do this. You're a 27 year old record store owner, not an airline executive. And, but he, he, he stuck with it. And, you know, Sarah Blakely sold mm -hmm. fax machines door to door. And now she's the billionaire owner of one of the leading underwear clothing companies in the world. So, and she, believe yeah, me. And who, by the way, uh, the deal that made, that really was her big break, which I think was with Neiman Marcus, maybe. Yeah, Neiman Marcus. I made a $300,000 order. Yeah, didn't she have to actually go try the Spanx on and like model it or no, I think she got the CEO. She got the buyer to go to the bathroom, to the bathroom. with her. Yeah. 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 And, be like, and, and then, like, and then by the way, about this, just put the damn things on and then let's talk. And then they said, can you fulfill this order in a month? And she said, yes, she had no clue about manufacturing. Right. She only had that one made for show purposes. <laughs> and so she and the manufacturers wouldn't trust her because what who are you? You you right. sell fax machines door to door. So finally she used persuasion skills to convince one to take a chance on her uh cuz they always need money up front. She didn't know how to do that and that started her business it's worth billions now. She I mean she owns the Atlanta Hawks. She's uh she gives tons of money to charity. She's a great person. Yeah, you know, I heard a, a story about Elon Musk, you know, that hit when he when they sold PayPal, I think the 
the narrative around Elon Musk is, well, he, you know, Silicon Valley got lucky billionaire. And then it's easy once you have a billion dollars to turn it into 200, you know, supposedly, which it must be why they all do it. Right. Not. Yeah. Um, but actually that's not what happened. He's his proceeds from the sale of PayPal was $180 million. He put a hundred of it into Tesla. He, I think he put 80 of it into SpaceX. And I mean, apocryphally he says I had to, I actually had to borrow the money to pay my rent. He, yeah. he took himself back to broke. So he could feel that heat again. Yeah, no, you're right. And so my point is, and all these stories speak, just all of your stories, all these other stories speak to the same thing. Believing that you can. Yeah, and and on the Elon Musk thing, he took a risk, but and that was a big risk. But trust me, it was a calculated risk. Because what you said earlier, Jeff's important. In order to win the game, you got to stay in the game. And so he knew in the worst case, he was diversified enough that something was going to come through or his investors would, would pop back out for one of his, at least one of his deals that he wasn't going to go broke, but he did get close to it. And it was a calculated risk. I think many people take uncalculated risk thinking that risk equals reward rewards only happen. If you reduce, like we all know the rewards are there, for instance, in entrepreneurship or the stock market. That's why we want to do these things. But that's 5% of your analysis is, okay, here's, th- th- these are the rewards. Here's how you get the rewards. That's that 5% of the job's done. The other 95% is mitigating the risks every step of the way. And that's why learning is important. That's why understanding monetization is important. That's why learning the skills of entrepreneurship is important. So that you can always fall back on this knowledge of how to, you know, uh, when you encounter a new risk, how to deal with it. So, so let me end with this question. Do you have an answer, a convenient soundbite answer that we can book bookend the show with and go, oh, there you have it to, yeah. okay, how come, let's say, you know, X percentage of people will hear you say this. They'll hear me say this. They've probably heard you say it before. They've heard me say it before. They've heard these stories of the Sarah Blakely's and the Richard Branson's of the world. And it's all, there's all this evidence exhibit A through Z, 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 Z. This can be done by average folks who put their pants on one leg at a time and yet 99% of them won't do it because they don't believe it can apply to them. Do you have the answer or the solution or do they need to click over to our episode of your show where we're well, going to dissect need, it for an hour? They definitely need to do that. And and also, I, but I will have, I will have a, a quote in a second that I was just thinking of, but most of the time people say things like the Nike quote, like, oh, you could just do it or you can do it. But I think sometimes positive quotes like that aren't really ho- helpful. Like I'll, people, will, I'll even do this. I'll start to think to myself, well, that's for other people. I, it doesn't really apply to me. Like I can't, I can't do it. And, but I think it's really important to remember this because this we can all relate to. If you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. So for instance, you know, if you never strike out and, and try starting a business, you're, you're certainly not going to make any more money than you're making today unless you get a raise, but it's very hard in this world right now. Or if you just keep playing the piano every day without really studying it, you're not going to get any better. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. You've got to change the way you do things. And the reality is probably that whether you're a listener of my show or of James's show or of shows like this in general, you probably aren't a hundred percent happy with what you've currently got. Uh, you mentioned skip the line. That's available, you know, Amazon and everywhere else, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, what? And I know you're at Altucher, A L T U C H E R on social media. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What else? What, is there anything? Um, people- yeah, I, I released a TV series on Amazon last year called Choose Yourself, which is named after one of my books. And so you can find that on on Amazon Prime. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. It's kind of what built my success. I care. I want to help other people with with no intentions of anything done in return. I'd have colleagues that would say, why do you waste hours talking to people on DM? They're missing the point and they're missing the magic.